Good afternoon and welcome to the Council of State Government's webinar on aging inmates and the graying of America's prisons. My name is Jeremy Williams and I am the Public Safety Analyst with CSG Southern Regional Office, the Southern Legislative Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us here today. We hope that uh, this session will provide you with some valuable information that may help you formulate policy in your state about how to best address uh, uh, the very serious, uh, very expensive dynamic of, uh, aging prison, of, the, of an aging prison population. Before we begin, I, w I did want to mention that you're in listen-only mode. However, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it in the question box in the GoToWebinar toolbar uh, on your screen. And you may, you may submit these questions uh, at any time during the presentations, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible uh, following, both, following both presentations. Uh, however, if we fail to get to your question, uh, we will certainly make sure it gets forwarded to the appropriate presenter uh, so that they may follow up with you uh, at a later time. Also note that we will be uh, recording this event, and it will be available at the CSG website at knowledgecenter.csg.org. That's knowledge, knowledge Center spelled out. Uh, .csg.org, and I, I believe you can look for it online by the middle of next week. Uh, it takes us a few days to format and post, but it should be available within a few business days. The, the aging inmate population is a topic that the SLC has tracked for some time uh, now. We, we issued a report in 1998 in response to this discovery that the increase in the geriatric inmate population was becoming uh, far greater than had been anticipated. Uh, we followed that up with a report in 2006 uh, during a time when we saw uh, as the baby boomer population in the country began to reach retirement age, there was a corresponding shift in the age of, of the prison population. Uh, however, the, the aging of the general population was, was only one part of that explanation, and through examining research conducted by experts such as, such as Dr. Aday, we discovered that other factors such as a uh, general increase in life expectancy combined with uh, tough on crime legislation passed during the, the late 1990s, uh, basically people living longer and staying in prison longer, uh, significantly contributed to the traje trajectory of this trend. Uh, and we took a survey of policies that southern states had implemented and or were in the process of implementing uh, that addressed this issue, uh, for example, through uh, designated housing for their geriatric inmate population, uh, consolidation of medical and security staff, uh, early release programs, and other programs for, for their elder, elderly inmate population. And without getting into too much detail, we found that our states benefited greatly, uh, both, both financially and from a public safety standpoint, uh, from, from these policies. Uh, today, I believe there are more than 125,000 inmates age 55 or older behind bars in the United States. Uh, and, and if you're curious as to, uh, to why I use the, the 55 years old uh, demarcation as opposed to, say, 60 or 65, it's that uh, due to stress of prison life and lifestyle choices outside of prison, uh, many experts contend that, that 55 is a, is a more accurate uh, mark uh, of being elderly in the prison population. And I think our presenters will, will speak more to that. Uh, but this number, 125,000, uh, represents an increase of more than 1,300%. Um, uh, 1,300 percent increase uh, since the early 1980s, and and more than 16 billion is spent um, uh, annually by state and federal governments uh, to incarcerate elderly prisoners, uh, and due largely to higher health care costs. I, I think about 3 billion of that 16 billion is uh, is attributed to specifically to medical costs. Uh, and for instance, here in Georgia, I believe we spend about 8,500 dollars annually on medical costs for an elderly inmate uh, compared to less than about a thousand dollars for those who, who are younger. Um, but at any rate, most estimates calculate that the cost of elderly inmates is being is at being at least twice as that of, of younger prisoners in some states. I think that number can be as much as four times, or about the same as incarcerating a maximum security prisoner. Uh, today we have two experts to tell us a bit more about the trends associated with uh, the aging inmate population. Uh, first we have Dr. Ronald Aday, Professor of Sociology and Anthropology at Middle Tennessee State University. He has been studying and writing about, writing about this topic uh, longer than almost any other expert in the field. He published his first article about older prisoners in 1978. He has uh, written books on the topic, uh, including uh, Aging Prisoners, Crisis in American Corrections, 
which I think is a very comprehensive look uh, at this dynamic and what, what state agencies can do uh, to address it. Uh, Dr. Aday holds a PhD from the University of Oklahoma. Uh, as I said, he's a national expert on the topic and, and he's here to share with us more, uh, some more details about um, uh, this trend in general, uh, advice on, on programs, best practices, uh, both during incarceration and, and release programs as well. Um, and then some of the challenges state corrections departments can face, uh, can expect to face in the years to come. Uh, following Dr. Aday's presentation, we'll turn to a look at a specific state, Oklahoma, and the types of innovative initiatives they've implemented uh, or are, are currently considering. Uh, here to present that information is Dr. Donald Sutmiller. He is the Chief Medical Officer with the Oklahoma De State Department of Corrections. Uh, he's been with the department for more than a decade and is responsible for the statewide management of approximately 300 healthcare employees. Uh, he was integral in the development and implementation of electronic, uh, the electronic health records uh, in Oklahoma. He's been a pr practicing physician since 1983 and holds a doctor of osteo osteo osteopathy uh, from Oklahoma State University. Uh, and I think this information will be valuable uh, insofar as it will provide some concrete examples of the uh, fiscal, public safety, uh, and and human challenges surrounding this issue, uh, as well as some insight into how these challenges can be addressed uh, at a state level. Uh, I apologize for the brief introductions. I did so in the interest of time. But uh, thank you both for being here. We look forward to your presentations. Uh, and with that, I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Aday. Thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate the opportunity to visit today regarding uh, one of the significant challenges facing our, our United States prison system. Just make just one one note of, of correction. Uh, I actually graduated from Oklahoma State University. I wouldn't want to, uh, since University of Oklahoma is kind of a, our uh, nemesis, especially on the football field. But uh, um, certainly uh, enjoyed my time and growing up in Oklahoma and starting my research um, um, on, on older prisoners uh, while I was uh, in that state. Um, we, we can go to the uh, the second slide uh, if, if we're ready, and uh, we'll just look at some of the, what I would like to visit today with some of the trends that we see taking place from a from a national perspective. Uh, what other states are doing, some of the challenges that they're facing, and as Jeremy talked about, there are there's different ways of looking at this in terms of trying to capture what do we mean by an older inmate. And many states still use age 50, uh, and but I think as the as the population increases significantly, I think we are moving more to thinking about 55 and older. Um, when I first started my research in this area, there's only about 3,000 inmates over age 50 in the 70s. So you can see where we were in 1991. We tripled about 10 years later. And between 2001 and, uh, and today, we've gone from a 113 to 250,000 over age 50. And you can just see the dramatic increase of now about 16% of our population, our state population our inmates 50 and over, and so since many of them are serving longer sentences, they will be in the 55 plus category uh, soon enough. As we look out in the future, one of the big issues in, another number, in around 10 more years, we're looking at about a half a million inmates over age 50, and by, uh, by 2030, of course, we're looking at around 400,000 inmates over age 55, and so if you look at our prison population today be around 1.3 million nationwide. You can see this really the tremendous challenge and graying of our prison population and based on certainly our, our current sentencing laws. So this is a, a problem that we are seeing not only in this country, but of, of course other countries are experiencing the same, some of the same kinds of things, although we are certainly in a, a baby boom situation now where some of the other countries um, might not have been. Um, on a given year now, we have about 900,000 uh, people age 50 and over that are arrested uh, in a, a larger significant number of 45 to 50, and that's that baby boom population. About 20% of those are committing felonies, so we certainly, if you're looking at that new elder offender are coming into the system uh, as, a, as a, an older offendee, that we're going to see more and more of, of those people coming in, and that's going to really swell the ranks. Uh, even more so in the future as we deal with this baby boom population. Uh, next slide, please. 
So we have these challenges that uh, we have to begin to think about. Of course, we know that many prison systems have been thinking about these things for a couple, three decades, but as we go forward, it's even going to be more critical, I think, to, to get some kind of plan in place uh, to try to develop policies and programs to deal with, uh, with this issue, and we're going to talk about some of those today in terms of what's going on, but just I've just listed a few questions there for you to think about, of course, in terms of looking at the, the increasing number of frail inmates and thinking about mental and physical health care issues and, and uh, end of life issues and what kind of policies are going to be needed to respond effectively and how can we partner with communities more, I think, to, to bring programming in uh, to help us deal with some of these issues. Um, and so those are just some of the challenges, of course, that we face, and just the, of course, the tremendous expense of trying to maintain the, this population that, for all practical purposes, are many of them are, are nursing home ready. They need to be in nursing homes, and just a tremendous cost and challenge to us in terms of keeping them in that kind of environment. Next. So we have these, you know, identifying the special needs of the geriatric offender, and we know that they have you know, significant number of mental health issues um, that our, our prison system in many cases have, have replaced our institutional mental health centers, um, you know, nationwide. And so we're including a lot of those that have many problems as well as chronic health problems. Uh, and, and the ME8 age 50 and over has at least three chronic illnesses just looking at 50 and over. And if you if you compare that to someone on the outside, a person 65 has on average of one chronic illness. Uh, women, women age 50 and over actually have 4.2 chronic illnesses on average. So you can see that this population has more mental health problems as well as physical health problems. And it has been estimated that at least 3,500 have sub symptoms of de dementia, and this probably might even be higher uh, if we ended up uh, testing for those cognitive impairments. Next slide. So one of our options, of course, and that we begin to think about, uh, although we don't sometimes identify this uh, like we do the juvenile justice system, is that we are, in fact, moving toward a geriatric justice system, uh, whether we want to formally call it that or not. Uh, we know that we have a police and court system that certainly needs to understand the mental health issues of, of the aging inmate, looking at competency issues, uh, looking at dementia and competency, so we're addressing some of those issues. Uh, we're thinking about house arrest and, and diversion programs, um, trying to keep people that, that do have some of these issues maybe out of, out of a prison setting. They might be more suitable alternatives for them. We're, of course, expanding our geriatric facilities, programming and health policies uh, across the country, and, and, and we'll talk about those later. And of course, we're introducing a second chance for lifers in, in some states, uh, giving them opportunities to, to go back and have their sentences reassessed, or the POPs program, which is, is looking at assessing them for, for coming back out and, and uh, as, as, a, as, as a significant risk or good risk coming back out. And then, and then the, the thinking about the more frequently utilizing compassionate release. Uh, many states have not done that effectively, but some states now are going back and revisiting that uh, as we look at the expenses and looking at the, over, the overriding burden of these inmates. And then, and then, um, then structuring programs that are designed for inmate reentry. When we do, when we do um, release these inmates, and in some cases, states are making efforts uh, in the in in the South and as well as other regions in the country to to bring them back out. How can we create this soft landing, this safe landing? What do we need in place in terms of housing, other kinds of benefits, uh, training programs, so that when they come when they come back out? It will be it will be uh, something that can be successful that uh, this reentry program because that in itself I see that's one of the biggest challenges we face as we move toward this system because I don't think we can can really continue to maintain to have you know 400 500 thousand inmates 55 and over incarcerated I don't think we can afford to do that so we're going to have to think about ways of getting them back out in society uh, in terms of looking at our sentencing and those kind of issues. And so we have to have some kind of structured programs in place uh, in order to make that happen. Next slide, please. So we have various programs then that, that, that we see emerging. We have over half the states do have programs that do special grouping of inmates uh, in dormitories or and sometimes dedicated special needs facilities 
or assisted living facilities or some nursing home-like facilities uh, and, we, and creating special kinds of environments uh, for them that would keep them safe and secure. But many states still lag behind uh, this kind of suitable programming for a large group of inmates that may be housed together. Uh, and that's one of the challenges, I think, in the future is trying to incorporate uh, programs from the community or individuals from the community that might be able to bring some of that programming in to offset some of the cost uh, and, and the lack of maybe uh, personnel to be able to, to do the programming with, within the facility itself. Next, please. So looking at the conditions, looking at thinking about pr best practice models and looking at effective prog programming, there's a number of things we have to think about. Uh, we have to think about the prison culture itself, uh, looking at how can we encourage healthy aging uh, in, among our inmates. If we're going to keep them there, we're going to retain them. And looking at the cost of, of, of retaining them and providing that health care, how can we create an environment so they are healthier, so that just like we're looking at on the outside and looking at healthy people you know, 2020, how can we make our inmates healthier and, and, and more cost efficient if we, have to keep, if we have to keep them there for the safety and security of society. And then looking at staffing adequacy. Do we have, does the staff understand the aging process? Do we have trained staff in place that understands the special mental and physical health needs of the, of the older inmate? And looking at the structure of the, of the facility, do we have space you know, for geriatric programming? Do we have space for, you know, that, that would be um, important uh, and, and useful for older inmates to be able to um, n navigate that in terms of ADA standards? Looking at community connections and the availability of volunteer agencies. Of course, many prisons may be isolated or in rural areas where we don't have the opportunity to have maybe certain volunteer agencies or special events or programs to draw upon, so that's going to be more of a challenge. And then looking at the inmate characteristics themselves in terms of what are they capable of doing, what are they interested in, and, 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 and looking at their crime classification, of course, and where, where can we house them based on that classification. These are a number, of course, challenges that we face as we think about effective programming designed for the geriatric inmate. Next. So some of the solutions in terms of programming issues, uh, we, we continue to think about the medically and cognitively challenged, looking at gender differences, uh, thinking about when we remove someone from the general prison population, uh, what does that do to, to them in terms of their opportunities uh, to engage in activities. We may take an, an, an inmate for safety reasons to put them in a special needs facility. It may take them away from a particular job that they might, might have. and so. Sometimes they feel isolated, bored, because they have nothing to do. It's hard to create a, a jobs for three or 400 inmates that we've grouped together based on special needs and health care needs. Uh, and, and so, so that's, that's a big challenge in terms of, and that's where the social programming comes in, in terms of therapeutic kinds of programs. And then looking at the, understanding the positive influence these social programs may have on their psychological and well-being and physical well-being. And we'll address that in a moment in terms of a best practice model. And then looking at the social participation, of course, is very crucial for us, this management of this growing population and, uh, and dealing with the uh, getting them involved in, the, in the, as an inmate population and buying into some of the, this, the best practice models that we're looking at. Next, please. So one of the things that we still are addressing is looking at what are the pros and cons of segregating uh, uh, inmates uh, and keep, are grouping them together, maintaining this environment. Uh, and we know that in many cases the feeling is if we group them together, we might be able to tr treat them in a more cost-efficient way. Uh, it, many older inmates maybe prefer to be around other inmates comparable to their age and creating this kind of supportive uh, climate. And so those are issues that still we're still struggling with as we look at space issues, we look at cost, cost issues. Uh, certainly we can't segregate if you're looking at you know, all the, the number, number of inmates as they grow uh, astronomically in the future. You know, it's, it's going to be hard to group every inmate you know, that's 8, 55 or 60 in special needs facilities because we don't have any, that many beds dedicated uh, you know, right now for, for that special group. And so we have to think about grouping them based on, of course, their mental and physical health needs, not just solely by age. Next. So we, we have a number of uh, 
what we've many states have done is created special programs for the older inmates. Uh, and there you see a couple of slides where you have in inmates, younger inmates that may be providing assistance, and that, that ends up being their job where they actually assume the responsibility for taking care of an older person. Uh, below you have uh, uh, an older inmate that actually is taking care of another, another inmate, and so we do see uh, a lot of this uh, informal kind of um, uh, caretaking that's taking place, and sometimes this might be their formal designated job uh, as we look at cost-related issues, and so we're think, you know, one of the trends is training um, inmates to to really perform the roles that what staff members might in the past engaged in, and so we'll see some more of that too. There's other programs out there like the Gold Coats in California system that assist the, the people with that have dementia, for example, and they're kind of, and we have some, of course, hospice programs around the country that have trained inmates that serve as hospice volunteers. And so that's what we're talking about in terms of prison assistance programs that have been very useful in terms of helping us care for this uh, special population. Next, please. Uh, other, of course, looking at you know work is a very important therapeutic activity. Just having something to do, creating some of those things. Some uh, inmates may get actually paid uh, up to two dollars an hour. I know in some cases, but what you're looking at is encouraging them either to get educational kind of jobs or, or educational programming or certain any kind of jobs that they can they can engage in. It's very important to especially those that are lifers that are spending the rest of their life in prison to keep them active and keep them engaged. Uh, and, and this is very good you know, for, for not only their for morale but also just their productivity and, and, and many of the older inmates as we know are very are excellent role models for younger inmates in terms of their, their work ethic. Next. Other jobs, of course, that have been created. Many prisons have have the the, the dog training programs and other just uh, manual kinds of jobs, menial kind of jobs that that's been created for that older inmates that might be able to that couldn't do maybe some of the heavy labor can do some of the housekeeping chores. Uh, next, please. And then education programs. Uh, some some program. The state of Ohio, for example, if you don't have a college, uh, excuse me, a high school degree, then you go to you go get a GED. Everyone's required, regardless of age, to get it to be working toward a GED if you don't have one when you come into the system. So this is a, some pictures of uh, two of them are pictures of older inmates there who were getting working toward their GED uh, while they were ha housed at the, one of the women's facility in Ohio. And another lower, the lower picture there, of course, is looking at um, a special training program that one of the older inmates is involved in. So, again, very important in terms of, of uh, education training. Uh, sometimes we don't think about these inmate, these t older inmates having access to those things, and in some cases, some cases our correctional system actually don't let them be, be involved in in those kind of programs, especially if they have life sentences. Uh, but it is. If you're serving life, and, and and even we know that in most cases, even if they have life sentences, they're going to eventually get out of prison, and so we want them to be prepared, uh, of course, in, in terms of to make that transition. Uh, so training and, and programs can be just as important for older inmates, although sometimes they don't get the, the access. Um, next slide. Uh, again, a, a variety of arts and crafts kinds of programs in terms of bas best practice models. The, pro the, the slide you see on your left there, the latch, latch hook rug making is, is the, in the uh, northern Nevada uh, prison that we'll talk about. The True Grit program, if some of you have heard of that. And this particular activity was established to help the, the men deal with their arthritis in their hands. And so they have, so they, like, this is their work every day. They come to this pro program and they, they, they make various kinds of uh, Rugs and other kind of hats and caps and gloves that they then donate to uh, to uh, private organizations or even our military, uh, and so that's something that that they looked at in terms of to counter the uh, arthritis in in later life. And the other other slide is uh, is a group in Ohio, of course, in terms of looking at some uh, activity that that these older women were involved in in their resourceful program. Uh, next slide, please. These are also two other programs. Uh, we know that Virginia has an excellent program uh, 
uh, for their older inmates. Uh, and, this, and then there's some, some pictures from, from Nevada again in terms of music therapy, uh, that they have a, a group of people that um, they, they play music, they sing, uh, they enter entertain. And so they have actually three different groups. Uh, they have a doo-wop group, a music group, and a country group. And, and, and so these are things that they participate in uh, quite frequently, uh, and they found that it's been um, uh, one of the ways that keeps them uh, going and keeps them involved in, in the TICTOR program as just one of the options that in this um, um, maximum security prison in northern Nevada. Next slide, please. Uh, just engaging in groups, group activities together. Uh, as a gerontologist, one of the things that uh, that we that we find in term that's very very effective to group older people together, so that they can have group counseling or psychotherapy groups or just support groups for aging inmates. Uh, and I've given you some examples of different kind of groups there that we see that's emerging uh, in some of the uh, in some of the uh, uh, facilities that are are treating and, and working with older inmates, where it's whether it may be grandparenting groups uh, from prison. Reminiscence groups, recreational groups, life history groups, where they're writing their autobiography, uh, maybe a sexual abuse support group, uh, grief groups. These are different kinds of groups that we see that are very that can be very cost effective, and sometimes we can find uh, people on the outside that can come in and lead these groups, uh, grouping older inmates together, and so that they can talk about their issues, talk about their aging issues. Uh, and it does, we do, do find it does provide a lot of positive therapeutic effect from a mental health perspective, and as well as giving them purpose in, in life in terms of engaging in those activities. The other picture you see at the top there, one's an act, activities group, of course, is the uh, is a group uh, of, of older uh, women that are in California that are, that are in, a, in a, a domestic violence group called the Golden Girls, and that's been very very effective for them in terms of uh, giving, helping them uh, process the information of being being a, a abused victims, so that they can work through those issues and be pre better prepared uh, for reentry. Next slide, please. Uh, and then other supportive social environments. Uh, the the uh, slide on the right there is a, a, a Georgia prison uh, where these inmates are walking every day, and then you see some similar. Uh, activities going on uh, at the at the physical fitness unit in, in northern Nevada where they're uh, engaging in a wheelchair softball or wheelchair basketball uh, anyone that that can kind of maneuver and, and get out of their bed or, or engage in some certain certain kinds of activities uh, and so regardless of their ailments and issues and so that's very positive in terms of keeping uh, all these inmates involved regardless of their disabilities or limitations uh, next slide please so we, then we have, of course, uh, challenging end-of-life issues that we have to uh, deal with in terms of, of caring for uh, for this population. And as, as we look at the dementia units, of course, and, and hospice units, uh, and, and also just dealing with the frail, dealing with those that may need walkers, and having, uh, of course, uh, end-of-life kind of, uh, you can see where you have hospice volunteers there and other uh, younger inmates that are helping uh, older inmates. Um, get out of bed and things like that, but that's going to be you know, more and more common as we go forward as is many of these uh, inmates that cannot get compassionate release and we hold on to them. That's going to be the challenge of keeping, uh, keeping them uh, uh, health, health well and, and, and healthy as, as possible, of course, and safe in these environments. Uh, next slide as we go into, um, uh, go into just one, one best practice model. And, and in terms of we, there's a number of states where we have course a lot of interest and a lot of excellent programs that are emerging uh, one of the ones that's drawn some national attention is the one called uh, true grit just to take you briefly through some of the activities there and there are uh, you can go online of course and and uh, and the corrections magazine has has published some of the activities as as well as you can go online and, and uh, download some a video or two that that kind of demonstrate some of these issues but the the, the this program is a structured program, and that means that everyone that comes into this program is screened coming in. Uh, there's about 170 inmates that participate now that are over age 60 in, in northern Nevada, this northern Nevada prison. And so everyone has a job in this program. Everyone has to go. They have to follow through. They have a, a, a care plan, 
a, a contract that they sign, that they're going to participate in these activities, these thrift therapeutic activities. So they have two purposes. One is for those inmates that's going to be there. They have, they have various kind of programs and, and, and activities um, to, to that are therapeutic in nature, helping them adjust, helping them deal with those issues. They also have a, a reintegration program a program that helps th prepare them to go to go back out into society and it's been very successful in terms of those that have gone gone out and been able to stay out of prison so uh, very it's, you know the structured program of this is not just is very important in terms of there is a lot of discipline involved uh, they have there's a certain uh, dress code uh, and, and, and the appearance code that they have to comply with and so it's a, a program that many of them feel that like they're privileged to belong to. I've visited that program and the camaraderie and just the uh, just the, um, the therapeutic purpose sense of, of, of being a part of this group is just uh, I was very impressed with uh, this structured program and, and what it's doing uh, uh, to, to create this effective uh, social environment for them. Uh, next slide. Uh, and some other programs that they're that they're you know, engaging in in terms of programming reentry that I've mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. And so, one of the things that the True Grit program has found is there's it's been cost effective in that the program uses entirely outside volunteers. There's been no no money whatsoever that's been dedicated to this program of 160 inmates. Uh, the the person that's created this program was actually she's this uh, the sex sex abuse therapist there and so she works with sex offenders uh, and and so volunteer inmates serve as volunteers in the program and then they have other they have a vet to vet program so you have volunteer vet vets that come into the program other former teachers student interns uh, that come in and and actually operate and run the program as well as a community minister uh, they have have all their all their crafts all their program things, their, even their, their special uniforms that they wear, their shirts, are all donated. And so they've actually created this program, uh, you know, with, with, zero, with zero state dollars. And it's been very effective in terms of creating a wellness kind of thing. We know that there's fewer days in medical. Uh, they've documented that there's a tremendous reduction in, in drug consumption with almost none of the inmates now on any kind of, uh, of mood, mood elevating uh, uh, pills or anything in terms of de dealing with depression and and even those people that have gone to medical they can't wait to get back out to that group they want to know what's going on in group and they say try to get better and, and get back out into there so that they can associate with their group so just looking at the dynamics of this program it has been extremely successful and I think in in addressing some of the special needs and and can be a, I think a model program that could be implemented um, in, in in other in other states, other communities. Of course, the key here is looking at community partnerships and working with people on, on the outside as well, I think, to reduce those, some of those costs, et cetera. But it's, it proves that something that can be done with creativity uh, and bringing some of the outside forces in to, to serve this special needs population. Uh, next slide. That may be the last slide. <laughs> OK, and so. Uh, yeah, yeah. Those, those are that this particular program. Just to make one final comment, has received uh, you know some national attention, uh, and I know that it's in terms of um, several of the news channels have picked up some of the issues, and so hopefully uh, some of the things that I've talked about today would will be important as we as we think about this population in two ways, one, three ways really. How can we how can we reduce the number of older inmates coming into the system? How can we reduce the number of baby boomers that's going to continue to swell that the population. That's one of the challenges is this growing population. Two, what do we do with, with those that have committed such, such crimes uh, that they're not going to be eligible for parole? A lot of the older inmates we know are there for various reasons, uh, for, for murder and for other issues. And then, then finally, how can we help them to, to gain reentry back into society, those that, those that are going to be eligible for that? Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Day. Uh, very interesting, excellent, uh, excellent information. Um, as I said, we'll move uh, straight into the second portion of the the program, uh, and then we'll follow that um, uh, with a brief time for questions and answers. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Sepp Miller. 
uh, thank you. I, I do appreciate the chance to uh, take part in this uh, webinar, especially with uh, Dr. Aday, uh, who is uh, quite authoritative. I appreciate his his uh, uh, mention that he was a graduate of OSU and not OU. As a graduate of, uh, of OSU myself, we, we understand that's a very important distinction in Oklahoma. Uh, in Oklahoma, we call it a house divided if a husband and wife are an OSU. Uh, we, uh, we are either red or orange uh, in Oklahoma. Well, the first slide is Oklahoma State Reformatory, and uh, somehow in my mind I connected old prisons with uh, older offenders. Uh, OSR is over 100 years old. Uh, it, it, uh, it, OSR had the first female warden in the country, uh, Clara Waters. Also had the first uh, fully accredited behind the walls high school in the United States. Uh, and it's just a cool looking old prison if you if you look at the uh, the uh, outside of it here it looks like it belongs in a movie uh, behind those old walls there's some more modern structures but but uh, but that I always like to uh, to show OSR because it just kind of looks like what people think a prison should look like uh, the next slide shows a brief overview of just a few statistics from Oklahoma and I, I want to begin by kind of introducing uh, what we do in this state and particularly the medical care, just kind of giving an overview of that and then move into to, uh, things that are more specific to uh, older offenders. We have, as you can see, uh, around 26,000 incarcerated offenders, about 90% male, 10% female. We incarcerate more males in Oklahoma than, than almost any other state in, in the nation, and, and we are uh, incarcerating, I believe, more females than any state in the nation. Uh, the average age is now uh, up to 38.1 years. Uh, in in 2000, uh, the state instituted 85% uh, uh, truth in sentencing laws. Uh, at that time, I believe there were uh, 11 offenses that would result in an 85% uh, sentence. Now I believe that number is up around 25. Um, uh, uh, just kind of historically, looking back over time, that in 1980 we had in Oklahoma uh, about 1,700 people incarcerated. About 5% of them were over 50. In 1994, we had about 13,700 uh, people incarcerated, and about 6% of those were over 50. Uh, currently, uh, you can see we have about 26,000. 4,223 are over 50, and that amounts to about 17% of our population. Uh, of those of 220, uh, give or take, at any given time, are confined to a wheelchair. Uh, the next slide shows uh, just uh, uh, the director, uh, Justin Jones. I, I usually have this slide in my presentations. Uh, he's a fairly visionary fellow, and I know that he supports uh, uh, programming and, and medical and mental health care for all offenders, particularly for older offenders, uh, and we appreciate his support. The next slide shows a, a map of Oklahoma, and if you see the green uh, institutions there, you can see that they are scattered literally to the four corners of the state. Uh, of course, this adds challenges uh, to uh, taking care of folks, particularly sick folks, uh, if you look and see that at Lexington and McLeod, which are closest to Oklahoma City, I can tell you that there we have, uh, in Lexington, two large male facilities, and in McLeod, a large female facility. And we do try to concentrate a lot of our older and sicker offenders uh, uh, in, in those locations. We, we utilize uh, specialty care and hospital care in Oklahoma City. We also utilize a, a, a hospital that is just due west of Lexington. Uh, probably less than an hour away for uh, for care for for a lot of our uh, a lot of our offender patients. Uh, the next couple of slides uh, just sort of go along with at least the way that I think about correctional medicine. There's a reason why we you know do what we we do in taking care of folks, um, and of course there are really many reasons. But one of the reason is the Eighth Amendment that that cruel and unusual uh, punishments shall not be inflicted. And then, of course, the, the next slide shows kind of the landmark uh, legal case of Still uh, versus Gamble that, that we shall not uh, 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 
be deliberately indifferent uh, to uh, the needs of, uh, of offenders. Um, and I think that, that really is something that we, we have to remember as we go forward taking care of folks. Um, the next slide shows that we have uh, across the state 17 different medical uh, clinics. Uh, five of those are staffed 24-7. Uh, there are three male infirmaries, one female infirmary, but there are only about 43 total infirmary beds in, in Oklahoma. Um, we also partner with a rural hospital, Lindsay Municipal Hospital, which is the hospital that's just west of Lexington. They have 22 inpatient beds. Those beds are behind a maximum security, uh, and we do a lot of the uh, general uh, medicine the general surgery orthopedics uh, at that hospital it, it is, to some extent, our prison hospital, although it is owned uh, and managed by the uh, community of, of Lindsay. And then our, our university here, o, OU Medical Center, provides some tertiary care hospitalization and, and much of our uh, outpatient specialty care. Uh, the next slide, please, shows that just to, for those who maybe aren't as familiar with, with correctional health care, just shows the sheer volume of what we do, that, that any given month we will see seven or 8,000 uh, sick calls uh, placed, uh, offenders requesting something in the way of health care, that, that we will have uh, uh, roughly a third of those will be processed by RNs uh, and then the remainder by PAs, nurse practitioners, and by physicians. We'll, we uh, have 3,000 dental visits a, a month. We have 2,800 mental health visits a month, so we, we do a, a fairly large volume of business. Uh, the next slide uh, also shows that we process a tremendous number of uh, prescriptions, 40, 47,000 monthly. Uh, of those, about 5,700 are, are offenders who are taking psychotropic medications. And at any given time, we will have eight or 9,000 offenders at least who have serious chronic medical illnesses such as diabetes or high blood pressure. Uh, we have about 660 hospital days per month, 127 ER visits, uh, just a, a large volume of care that we, that we deliver. The next slide, please. And finally, uh, we are, are fairly well staffed in our state, um, except for perhaps in those facilities that are 24-7. It's just hard to find nurses who who, who would like to work at, at night and evenings. Those are the more challenging uh, places to, uh, to staff. And then the last couple of points uh, demonstrate, first of all, that, that we have been, um, we've tried to keep our costs down when it comes to medical care. Our costs actually are, are lower now than they were five years ago. Um, and then the, the last point shows that that when it comes to our operational expenditures, that is not counting personnel costs, that almost all of those expenditures are for outside medical care, for hospitalizations, for specialty care, for that sort of thing, and for pharmaceuticals. And next. So this is, uh, uh, besides for OSU, this is another one of my alma maters. This is where I learned correctional medicine and where I, where I graduated. I uh, was not an offender there. I was a physician there. Uh, Dick Connor is a, a medium uh, security uh, prison with a minimum security uh, uh, attached. Uh, there, there's an infirmary there. We have a lot of uh, older and sicker uh, offenders who, who are housed there. Uh, outside of Lexington, uh, this is probably the next uh, busiest uh, uh, facility that we have when it comes to, uh, to uh, sick offenders. Uh, so uh, next slide, I have a... a, a a, a brief summary of one of my patients that I had when I was at Dick Connor, uh, who I will call Mr. P. He, he entered the uh, Department of Corrections when he was 85. Uh, he had uh, murdered two people, uh, and he was sentenced to life without parole. And I have to say that he certainly got his money's worth. Uh, he lived in the general population until he was about 95 years old. Uh, and, and as Dr. Day was saying, oftentimes, older offenders are assisted formally or, or informally uh, by uh, other offenders. Um, in Mr. Uh, P. 
P's case, uh, he had one particular offender who sort of adopted him and helped take care of him and who would come with him when he had uh, uh, medical appointments and so on. Uh, and he would keep me advised on how he was doing. And they just helped the old fellow on the unit until he got to where he really could no longer manage. And then finally he was moved into, uh, into the infirmary there at Dick Connor where he lived to the ripe old age of, a, of about 101 and a half. And then he, uh, he, he finally uh, expired. But uh, he's just an example of, of, of how very old some of our patients can be and, uh, and how they manage and how we manage them uh, in, uh, in prison. The next slide. Uh, Dr. Day mentioned, uh, it's been mentioned, uh, the, the, the cost of caring for older offenders. You know, it, there are kind of varying reports from state to state, but probably at least two, three, four times what it costs for younger offenders. Uh, if you go to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid site, uh, this is, these are numbers from the community. And if you look at those numbers, you can see that for those under 44, from 19 to 44, that their cost was about $3,370. That when you reach the age of 55, that has more than doubled. When you reach the age of 75, that that number more than doubles again. And then, of course, rises significantly over the age of 85. So whoever statistics that you use, it's, it's obvious that as folks get older, that, that it costs more to care for them. Uh, the next slide, please. Our analysis unit just recently completed this, uh, uh, this study. Uh, they came up with the number of offenders that we had over, uh, over 50. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, how their sentence length is broken down, that uh, 1,934 of those 4,223 offenders over 50 are serving very long sentences. Uh, and they estimate or project that that of these offenders over 50, that on average that they will have uh, at least 19 years left to serve. So if they're over 50, they're going to be 69. If they're 60, they're going to be 79 uh, before they discharge their sentence or otherwise might leave our care. Uh, I just think that's fairly remarkable. It just, it just shows that even though we have a 17% now who are, are over 50, that our offender patients are going to be getting older and older and older while they're in our care. The next slide, please. This also shows the way that we uh, determine medical and mental health acuity for, for offenders. Uh, it shows that uh, at least 1,000 of these offenders have moderate to, to severe uh, uh, medical acuity, have serious illnesses, and, uh, and at least 314 uh, have uh, serious or very serious uh, uh, mental illnesses. Uh, next slide. I like this quote. This is from uh, Clinical Practice of Correctional Medicine, uh, 2006. Uh, and I, I refer to this fairly often in talking to some of my physicians and so on. But it says the primary purpose of prisons and jails is not to provide health care. And I, I think that it's practicing clinicians in, in prison, you know, we, we know that. We know that prisons and jails are, are to separate people from society for a period of time. But we also know that, that, uh, that by, constitution, by constitutional right or, or decree that, that offenders certainly have a right to, to health care. Um, next page, or next slide. Uh, so how, how do we accommodate for some of these older guys? In Oklahoma, we have, uh, we have infirmary beds. Uh, we have a, a one fairly sizable medical unit, and we have several other units that are modified or otherwise adapted for uh, the care of older or sicker offenders, and we'll look at a few of those in a minute. You know, most DOC beds are not air-conditioned. Some are. Um, certainly, we try to, to locate uh, older and, and, and sicker offenders in air-conditioned areas, but uh, again, as, uh, as our offenders uh, age, uh, that could be an, an issue. Uh, we have various facilities of various designs. Some are, are really fairly modern, but even the modern ones tend to have steps uh, because our 
20 years old or so, or, or, or older, uh, many of them. So they have steps that have to be negotiated. Some of them have significant hills. Uh, some of them have been adapted from other state buildings, from old uh, mental health facilities or, or schools. So they're not all obviously designed uh, for uh, handicapped uh, or uh, debilitated or, or older uh, offenders. Uh, one of the things that we can, can do is we can do compassionate release, or what we call medical parole. We actually can do parole or commutation. Uh, since 2008, we have considered 270 offenders, and 80 have actually been paroled to the street, uh, with uh, the, the largest number of any given year being 27 in 2010. That This number tends to go up and down a bit over time. Uh, we also do use offender assistance. We have policy that governs what they can and cannot do, but, but, uh, but they can be very helpful on, on medical units. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, also again uh, in a minute. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are the infirmaries. We have uh, you know eight beds at uh, at Dick Connor where where I used to work. Mostly that uh, facility, those that infirmary is filled with really custodial care patients, men who are paralyzed or men who uh, uh, have a serious dementia or Parkinsonism or for whatever reason, really uh, have difficult time uh, even getting out of bed. So, so there's not a lot of turnover in those in those uh, infirmary beds. Down at Lexington, at Lexington Correctional Center, we have 10 beds, and those beds tend to be filled with the sickest of our sick patients, uh, uh, men with cancer or or uh, other very very serious uh, illnesses. Uh, Mabel Bassett is our female facility, uh, and uh, partly because of our only 10% of our offenders are, are female, those beds uh, sometimes uh, are not all full. And then in Oklahoma State Penitentiary, uh, we have uh, 17 maximum security uh, infirmary beds. Uh, next slide. Uh, in 2007, we established a, a, a unit for older and sicker offenders at Joseph Harp Correctional Center that we call the J unit, just because that's the name of the building that uh, that we use. There are 248 total beds in the J unit. Uh, there is uh, there are about 1,400 offenders at Joseph Hart, and there is a main medical uh, where most offenders are seen. But on the J unit, there's also a satellite uh, station for a clinician, for a provider, and for nurses, uh, and for pill lines, and so on, so so that these offenders can receive their medications and their care, uh, oftentimes without having to leave that unit. There are 22 unit orderlies who assist uh, with a number of duties, including uh, just some assistance with the activities of daily living. Uh, for uh, uh, the offenders who are there, there are uh, uh, about 50 uh, offenders who are uh, confined to a wheelchair in the J unit. Uh, there are 40 of them are diabetics. Uh, 130 of them have to be given medications on pill line. They have to go present for medicine. Most medicines are keep on person for for our offender patients, if you take blood pressure medicine or such, you can keep that on person. Uh, uh, pill line medications would be uh, some psychotropic medications for mental health or uh, narcotics or that sort of thing. Uh, for the offenders there at, on the J unit, I have offender assistants who are actually housed with them because they have severe dementia. Uh, and uh, that's proven to really work very well. Those offender assistants uh, do a good job. They're compassionate and help take care of those, those old fellows. Uh, next slide. Uh, also, uh, some facilities just identified the need for extra housing for uh, for uh, sicker or older offenders, uh, and uh, really over time, kind of developed their own modified GP beds. Uh, at the female facility, there's uh, there are about 100 patients who uh, are on a particular unit. There's a satellite nursing station there. Uh, also, at, at uh, two of the minimum security male facilities, uh, they have identified units where they put the more medically compromised patients, where they're able to uh, keep up with them, where they're together, uh, not so much segregated, it's just, it's just uh, cared for because they're a, a bit more vulnerable. And next slide. So, I included this story about TW because, because he's not an exception. Uh, this is a fellow who is 81 years old. He is not housed in an infirmary. 
He's housed at a minimum security facility. He has a colostomy, which uh, means he has an opening in his abdomen that allows him to, to empty his bowels. And he has a suprapubic catheter, which means he also has an opening in his abdomen that allows him to empty his kidneys. Um, of course, he's seen by nurses for, for uh, colostomy care and for catheter care. Um, and he's seen, as he needs to be, periodically uh, by a physician and seen for chronic illness by a physician. Uh, he takes uh, five medications. He's got five identifiable chronic illnesses. You know, he hasn't been hospitalized in over a year, uh, and if he, if he lives another four years, he may discharge his sentence from the Department of Corrections. He's 81 already. He already has these problems, uh, so the challenge is taking care of him uh, outside of an infirmary and, and uh, uh, on one of those modified medical units. Uh, and the other challenge ultimately will be where will he go uh, when he discharges. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, we have about uh, uh, we have a number number of other offenders who who are uh, in wheelchairs and who uh, are on walkers and so on and so forth. Uh, we did a survey in 2013, just finished it, and we took Medicaid criteria for nursing home admission, and we found 67 offenders who we thought would immediately qualify for nursing home placement. Uh, right now, those offenders would be housed mostly in an infirmary or maybe on the J unit. We found, we found some uh, additional offenders who we thought would qualify for an infirmary care, but not but perhaps not for a nursing home. We found 500 other offenders who uh, who could use uh, uh, special uh, uh, medical housing, such as the J unit, and almost 200 more who who could uh, who could be well served by that modified. GP housing, like uh, we discussed a, a, a little bit earlier. Next slide. So uh, getting down here toward the end of, of what I have to say, so, so planning ahead, uh, what can we do? One of the things we've done successfully in Oklahoma is we've been able to use Medicaid funds uh, to pay for some hospital admissions for some offenders if they qualify under, under Oklahoma Medicaid uh, rules. Medicaid also should uh, likewise pay for nursing home care for those same offenders who qualified. Now, Oklahoma did not expand Medicaid services under the Affordable Care Act, uh, so had that happened, then essentially every offender would probably uh, qualify for Medicaid. Uh, right now, the qualifications are disability or over 65 uh, Essentially, those are the qualifications to, to, for, to pay for hospital care or for nursing home care. So uh, one question is, is, is would it be uh, uh, to our benefit to uh, be able to place those 67 offenders in a nursing home uh, and to utilize Medicaid to help pay uh, for their care? Medicaid in Oklahoma would pay for about two-thirds of the cost of uh, nursing home care, and uh, DOC would, would pick up one-third of the cost. Uh, when you do the math, it looks like that that uh, probably would not be a, a, a bad strategy for Oklahoma. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Um, you know, we have developed that J unit uh, in 2007. Uh, we are aware that we need to, to develop more uh, medical housing uh, in a centralized location uh, and uh, we're looking at ways that we might be able to, to do that. Um, obviously, it involves funding and, and planning and so on. Uh, some of the other things that we have done to uh, uh, improve uh, access to care, quality of care, is we have been trying to expand on-site medical care and telehealth. We also have uh, expanded the roles uh, of mid-level providers uh, under the Portable Care Act we're likely to see uh, increasing shortages of primary care physicians. Uh, so whenever it's appropriate, and if we can use mid-levels, that, that allows us to use our, our physicians uh, where they're most needed. And next slide. Uh, and this is uh, essentially the last slide. And uh, I put this in here again to remind myself and to remind folks that that when we, uh, when we walk through uh, through the gate, that we don't we don't leave our 
our uh, practice ethics outside, uh, that we do the best that we can to take care of our, of our patients. And the last slide, I believe. Okay, so before you ask questions, if you have any, the explanation for this slide is stick a fork in me. I'm done. All right, thanks, thanks, Dr. Stuntmiller. Great, great uh, information. I, I know we've reached the um, the top of the hour, but we did have one question come in, and I think we have. Um, I think we'll go ahead and, and take it. It's a good question. Um, the question is, how, how do you address issues with nursing homes and skilled care facilities not accepting inmates on parole? So, uh, I guess inmates that um, question of housing inmates that uh, have been paroled but need uh, some level of of uh, skilled care. Um, and either of you, if, if you wanted to field that question, feel free to, to chime in. You know, in Oklahoma, uh, one of the things that we've done is we've, we have assigned one of our RNs to be a, essentially a case manager for, uh, for offender patients. Uh, so at the time of discharge, really, we just beat the bushes uh, for nursing homes who might accept uh, offenders who are discharging. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, sex offenders are probably the most difficult to place. Uh, honestly, we have had to go out of state uh, at times to be able to find a nursing home. Uh, oftentimes, we can find a, a, a placement, but it requires just heroic effort to do so. Uh, going back to what I had said earlier about about uh, nursing homes, I think that I think uh, I, I don't know that we will build a DOC nursing home. Uh, you know, in Oklahoma. But I believe if someone did, uh, that if they built it, they would come. Because uh, even if it was in a different state, if we could discharge offenders, particularly sex offenders, uh, to a nursing home that, that accepted offenders, I, I think that people would just break down their doors trying to, to get people discharged there. Okay, uh, we, we actually had one other question come in that, um, again, we'll, we'll, uh, I know we're going a little over, but uh, I think it's another great question. Um, we are not able to pre-qualify inmates for Medicaid, uh, so since they cannot apply until they are out, how do you provide funding? Uh, I'm assuming this is directed towards uh, Dr. Suttmiller, but again, Dr. Ade, if you'd like to chime in, feel free to do so. Uh, I'll let him answer the, the question, but I know that some some states, uh, you know, don't permit the don't permit the prequalification, and others do. You know, in terms of their their just just their their how they handle that so their system is very different. And I, I, what do you do in Oklahoma? You'd be prequalified in Oklahoma, I know. So, so that that's an advantage. You know, like Dr. Day said, every state is a little bit different in how they manage Medicaid, and either even under the Affordable Care Act there are some fairly significant differences between states. Uh, two points. One is, is that in Oklahoma, we are able to qualify offenders for uh, payment for some hospitalizations if, the, again, if the offender is disabled or over 65. So, so we do actually access Medica Medicaid, uh, Medicaid for, for some inpatient hospital stays for, for offenders who have been outside of the prison for 24 hours uh, uh, even though they are still actually one of our guys. Upon discharge, uh, we do is we we essentially make application um, at the time of discharge. Uh, it is cumbersome. It does take a little bit of time. In Oklahoma, the current process for Medicaid is that offenders are disenrolled whenever they become incarcerated. The centers for Medicare and Medicaid have recommended, and, and in Oklahoma, our health care authority uh, is considering, I know, uh, following the recommendation, that rather than disenrolling offenders uh, whenever they're, they're incarcerated, that they would be suspended. The difference being that if they're disenrolled, they have to be re-enrolled upon discharge. If they're suspended, then when they walk out the door, they are, uh, they, they again qualify for Medicaid. So I think the the ultimate answer, and I think that CMS has given guidance on this, is that offenders will be will be uh, suspended rather than disenrolled from Medicaid when they're incarcerated. Okay, great. 
like to, uh, we should go ahead and wrap up. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, both of you, uh, Dr. Day and Dr. Suttmiller, for uh, excellent presentations. We appreciate you taking taking the time and work uh, putting this information together and, and for taking time this afternoon to share it with us. Um, Again, just a reminder to the the audience that if if you know so, uh, if you know someone who was unable to join us or or if you wish to return to some of the information presented, the webinar will be available at the Knowledge Center, CSG's Knowledge Center, uh, knowledgecenter.csg.org, uh, within a few days. Uh, we post these events as YouTube videos, so uh, it includes obviously the audio, but also the PowerPoint slides. So they're very accessible, uh, easily forwarded on uh, uh, to others, and you can essentially revisit any portion of the webinar uh, through the video. Uh, before we close, I wanted to thank the audience again for joining us this afternoon. I, I hope you found the information useful. Uh, and again, if you have any uh, subsequent questions, if there's something you think of later, uh, please don't hesitate to send them along to me at jlwilliams at csg.org. That's J-L-W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S at csg.org. Uh, I'd also like to say a quick thanks to Heather Perkins and the other CSG staff for their technical support and for helping us to advertise this event. There's a lot of behind-the-scenes work that goes into putting these events together, and we appreciate their, their work and support. Uh, thanks again to our presenters and to everyone for joining us, and uh, have, a, have a pleasant afternoon.